Coming up on World News This Week, 129 people dead in a series of attacks in Paris on Friday night. Also, e-commerce giant Alibaba rakes in billions on its popular annual Singles Day. And victims missing with around four confirmed deaths following a mining accident in Brazil. Education will remain a key bilateral understanding between Papua New Guinea and Australia. Australia's Foreign Minister Julie Bishop says it's more people-to-people -people focused. The new Colombo plan will give equal opportunity to Australians to study and work in PNG. It is more likely to see Papua New Guineans being offered a place in any of Australia's universities to study. The new Colombo plan will see a reversed version of it being implemented in coming years. Australia's Foreign Affairs Minister Julie Bishop says undergraduates in Australia will be sent to PNG to leave, study and undertake an internship mentoring program in parts of the country. Ms. Bishop launched the new Colombo plan and embraced it as one of the key connections between PNG and Australia in the education sector. A total of 46 students from Deakin, Wollongong and James Cook University are targeted to be the first for the 2016 program. The new Colombo plan has also partnered with Westpac Bank, ANZ, General Electric, Oil Sets and ExxonMobil for the PNG engagement. PNG is among Singapore, Indonesia, Hong Kong and Japan for the new Colombo plan rollout in the Asia-Pacific region. The Colombo plan was launched by Ms. Bishop and Pat Minister Rimit Patno witnessed by Aya Education Minister Malakai Tabar in Port Mosby recently. To news in Paris, monuments around the world lit up in French colors in support of what has been described as one of the worst attacks in the West since 9-11. Addressing the media, Paris Chief Prosecutor François Molin said three teams of at least seven gunmen carried out the attacks at six different locations, including a major stadium, restaurants, bars, a shopping mall, and a sold-out concert hall. ISIS claimed responsibility for the attacks, supporting a video reported by the Daily Mail earlier in July this year, showing a French ISIS militant carrying out an execution on a Syrian soldier, vowing to fill the streets of Paris with dead bodies. 16-year-old Valentin Filonenko's father and brother, who were at the concert hall where one of the shootings took place, luckily survived. It was a rock concert, so they heard bangs at the beginning. They had only heard three of the band's songs, so they told themselves it was part of the show. But after 30 shots, everyone lay down on the floor. They heard a grenade and they thought it was the police coming to save them. So what happens? Lots of people start getting up. Quite a lot of people get up. They were all shot. Because they thought they were being saved, they were all shot. Les sauver. Okay, qu'est-ce qui se passe? A state of emergency was declared and even Facebook reacted with a feature for users to let family and friends know they are safe. Seven of the gunmen self-detonated themselves after the attack and three people have been arrested. The national response has been aggressive. What I want to say to French citizens is that we are at war. The president said it this morning, yes, we are at war. We're dealing with an act of war organized methodically by jihadist terrorists who have already organized and planned attacks. Five of them have been warded since this summer, but we have always said there is never a zero risk. We've always said we could see another terror attack. Leon Girari, MTV World News. Papua New Guinea will send a delegation to the 12th Festival of Arts in Guam next year. Acting Executive Director for National Cultural Commission, Dr. Jacob Simmet, announced this week that the commission is expected to have 170 participants represent PNG in Guam. The National Cultural Commission is moving ahead with plans to send participants to the 12th Festival of Pacific Arts in Guam. The festival will be held from the 22nd of May to the 4th of June next year. Acting Executive Director for National Cultural Commission, Dr. Jacob Simet, highlights the importance of the festival. Participants from Papua New Guinea will include performers, artists and musicians. NCC is hoping to raise a total of 2.3 million kina to participate in the festival. We normally recruit uh, our funding in the budget for 2016. 
now that we have not received the funding, there is a strategy now is to go to the minister in a, in a submission. And as I said earlier, this is not something. I don't think we have ever at all received funding for participation at festivals through the budget. The host country, Guam, has begun preparations to welcome more than 2,500 participants from 27 island nations and territories. Clive Edwards, Tonga's Minister for Justice, said the United States and New Zealand are dumping serious offenders in Tonga. Edwards told Radio New Zealand the offenders, some of them convicted murderers, are usually dumped in Tonga without any warning. He said he was usually unaware of deportations when they occurred. He said the offenders are accompanied by a police or immigration escort who then take off without notifying the government. There was a standoff between refugees and authorities on Australia's offshore refugee detention centre on Christmas Island last Sunday. The standoff followed the death of a male Iranian asylum seeker, Fazal Shegeni, who escaped on Saturday and was found dead on Sunday. The Australian Federal Police are investigating his death. Fences at the facility were torn down and fires were lit forcing guards to abandon the facility and allowing access to vulnerable inmates by other detainees. Australian politicians demanded the government disclose the extent of destruction caused by the riot. There is a crisis inside Australia's immigration detention centres and it is time for the government to start being upfront with the Australian people about what is going on and to ensure a proper independent investigation and review of the conditions and of the management of the facilities. We take uh, the management of the detention centre network very seriously. Uh, if people have caused damage to Commonwealth property, uh, they will be investigated and prosecuted in relation to those matters. Coming up after the break, four deaths have been confirmed as the search continues in Brazil for victims of a mudslide and a major offensive launched against ISIS to retake the town of Sinja. Those stories and more after the break. Stay with us. In South America, around 25 victims are still missing following a landslide in a Brazilian village. Described as one of the worst mining disasters in Brazil's history, the mudslide was caused by burst dams at an iron ore mine, forcing cities over 300 kilometers away to cut off drinking water last Monday. One of the victims of the mudslide was five-year-old Emanuele Fernandez, whose body was pulled from mud and rubble by firefighters late on Monday and identified by her family. Uh, uh. In a way, this brings us some comfort because they found her body. If they had not found her body, it would have been even sadder. Yes. Others rescued included this dog, who was trapped in the waist-deep contaminated mud, as thick as wet concrete. Health officials are monitoring the toxicity of the water since cutting supply on Monday for over 24 hours. The mine, jointly owned by Australian company BHB Billiton and government-owned Vale SA, and run by mine operator Samarco, was criticized by residents and officials for its lack of communication. Public outcry has included calls for tighter regulation over the powerful mining industry. This is a nightmare. I never thought we had to live through anything like this. Not to mention that we are homeless and that my five-year-old daughter was a great friend of hers. Now I have to tell her that Emanuele is in heaven, but it's very hard. Alana Lee. MTV World News. A British flight narrowly missed a rocket attack in late August while approaching Egypt's Sham el Sheikh in the Sinai Peninsula. The close shave was recently confirmed by Thomson Airways. Following investigations, UK government experts concluded that there was no cause for concern and that flights could safely continue. The rocket missed the jet carrying 189 passengers by a mere 300 meters, but authorities do not believe it is related to the recent downing of Russian Metrojet Flight 9268. Kurdish forces have launched a major offensive to retake the town of Sinja from ISIS. The terror group recaptured the Iraqi town in August last year and abducted thousands of women and girls, forcing them into slavery. 
The renewed fighting has forced desperate refugees to arrive on the shores of Europe. Hands starts to wave. The team on land signals back. The volunteers have witnessed this countless times before. The frantic disembarkment brought on by the overwhelming emotions of having survived. Just over 24 hours ago, 18 people drowned in these waters. A mother cradles her child, who was handed over to medics, relief etched on her face. It is hardest on the little ones, wrapped quickly to keep them warm. This group is from Afghanistan. Greek lifeguard volunteers keep their eyes peeled on the horizon. As more arrive, these refugees fleeing war-torn Syria. Others wait for ferries to the mainland. Exhausted children sleep anywhere. Two-year-old Ali is in his favorite Tigger outfit, the only thing brought to remind him of home. All his toys were left behind. Ali is from Jarablus. His uncle, the family says, was one of the first five rebel fighters beheaded by ISIS when they took over before Ali was even born. We had to leave, his mother says. It's only now that I was able to save the money, his father adds. Both want to remain unidentified. Their own parents are still living under ISIS. The flood of refugees has not decreased with the coming of winter. And no crackdown on smuggling, no fences put up by European nations is going to stop the most desperate of peoples. The visuals do tend to speak for themselves. This massive pile of life jackets is just a fraction of what you will find littering the beaches, the coastline of this island. Each family, each person has a heartbreaking story of leaving everything behind, knowing that their children may never see their homeland in their lifetimes. India's Prime Minister started off his week with a three-day visit to the UK, where he met with British Prime Minister David Cameron and later addressed the British Parliament. The jet-setting PM, however, has led some to say he has not offered enough to deal with India's problems. Nope, not a rock star. Or a Hollywood heartthrob. It's Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi in New York's Madison Square Garden. Not many world leaders can boast this kind of crowd pull, from Sydney's Olympic Park to Dubai and San Jose, rousing India's 25 million strong diaspora. In 17 months, Modi has traveled to nearly 30 countries. That's pretty much one day a week, checking out culture, taking selfies, no, getting emotional. There's no doubt Modi's globetrotting ways generate buzz, promoting India on the world stage, attracting foreign investment. But it also comes at a cost. Initially, it was OK because he was trying to focus on the relationship. But now I think it's getting a little bit excessive. And he should actually, actually stay in India, look at the day-to-day -day problems and try to find solutions. And the criticism extends beyond the streets. Is it true Narendra Modi just boarded a flight to visit India? Welcome home, Mr. Prime Minister. How long will you be staying this time? Reads this tweet. By the end of this year, Modi would have traveled to some 33 different countries. But many people here are beginning to wonder whether racking up the air miles is going to translate to anything tangible for India. Modi's government says the impact is already visible. Prime Minister's visits have created an unprecedented impact. Heads of governments associate with India and the Indian leader at a new wavelength, wrote India's finance minister in a recent Facebook post. In terms of the dollars and jobs, that's just a matter of time. Until then, onwards to Turkey, Singapore and France. Coming up next on World News This Week, E-commerce giant Alibaba breaks its single-stay record in the billions and the mystery buyer of two rare diamond rings worth millions revealed. Those stories and more after the break. Stay with us. Chinese e-commerce giant Alibaba kicked off this year's single-stay with a 24-hour sales marathon at midnight on Wednesday. 
The single-stay campaign proved successful for the company, breaking its multi-billion dollar record. Singles Day, celebrated worldwide on the 11th of November, is a play on the four single digits involved in the date and is a major shopping day launched by Alibaba in 2009. The online shopping giant smashed its record from last year by 60% within a mere 12 hours, amassing a whopping 91.2 billion won by close of trade. Uh, yes, the Chinese economy has been slowing, but um, the number of people shopping online has been increasing uh, at a much faster rate. And also, um, the number of products that are available online has been increasing uh, every year. Alibaba, which makes up 80% of China's internet sales market, hyped up Singles Day with promotional TV appearances featuring celebrities both Chinese and Western. In a statement, Alibaba chief executive Daniel Zhang said the event would show the world the power of Chinese consumption, which proved true as the company recorded an estimated 120,000 orders made per minute. Over 27 million purchases were made by mobile phone in the first hour. Meanwhile, the U.S.'s biggest online shopping day, Cyber Monday, brought in $1.35 U.S. billion. So it will be interesting to see uh, within the next 12 months who else will Alibaba and other e-commerce players invest in or buy because increasingly this is questioning the value of offline retail. Why bother having shops where there's inventory, people have to drive there, take public transportation, carry the things back. You know, e-commerce is winning over more and more customers in China, including in things like groceries. So I think, you know, we don't need to validate e-commerce anymore. The question is how rapidly uh, is it taking over? A massive gold mine has been discovered off the coast of China's coastal province of Shandong with an estimated 470 tons of reserves. The mine was found 2,000 meters underwater near Shandong's Sanxian Islands. Provincial officials announced that the gold deposit holds 470.47 tons of gold worth roughly 22 US billion dollars. The project involved around 1,000 workers who used 67 drilling platforms to complete 120 kilometers of drilling over three years. China overtook South Africa as the world's largest gold producer in 2006. The rare Blue Moon Diamond found in South Africa's Cullinan mine in January last year has sold for over 48 million Swiss francs, equivalent to over 141 million kina on Wednesday. The 12.3 carat jewel was purchased by Hong Kong billionaire Joseph Lau, who promptly renamed it the Blue Moon of Josephine after his daughter. The Blue Moon Diamond broke Sotheby's world auction record for a gemstone by around 2 million. Tonight we set a new world record, new auction record for any diamond, any jewel, any gemstone uh, with the sale of the Blue Moon Diamond which has been named by a Hong Kong private collector the Blue Moon of Josephine. The Blue Moon of Josephine. Okay. It sold for 48,468,158 thousand dollars per carat. Meanwhile, at rival auction house Christie's on Tuesday, a large rare pink diamond was auctioned off for over 28 million Swiss francs, over 82 million kina. Again, Hong Kong billionaire property developer Joseph Lau was the buyer of the only third pure vivid pink diamond Christie has seen in over 250 years. The 16.8 carat diamond ring is set in a platinum and gold ring and was renamed Sweet Josephine by Lau, again after his daughter. SeaWorld theme parks are the ultimate tourist destination, but the chain of marine parks recorded a loss of over $25 US million in its last quarter of 2014. Attendance have been hitting an all-time low thanks to the 2013 documentary Blackfish, which uncovered the cruelty and disturbing treatment of killer whales or orcas. SeaWorld is now phasing out its signature show based on killer whales. The huge turnaround for SeaWorld audiences was the 2013 documentary Blackfish, which explored the cruel conditions in which orcas are kept. Responding to the devastating drop in popularity, SeaWorld's CEO on Monday spoke of a new direction for the company. In 2017, we will launch an all-new orca experience 
it's going to be focused more on the natural setting, natural environment, and also the natural behaviors of the whale. And it will have a strong conservation message. And that means that 2016 will be the last year of our theatrical killer whale experience called One Ocean. So that right now is in San Diego based on the customer feedback we're getting there. Backlash from the documentary also included new legislation in New York, California and Washington banning orca captivity. SeaWorld responded to negativity brought on by the documentary with a $15 million campaign promoting its protection and care for orcas and other animals. Meanwhile, SeaWorld San Diego, which currently holds 11 killer whales in captivity, is legally challenging an order from San Diego's Coastal Commission to end orca captive breeding, although other countries still practice orca captivity, including Spain, Russia, and Canada. Alana Lay, MTV World News. Coming up after the break, rock crabs found to be contaminated with high levels of domoic acid along California's coast, and an entrepreneur takes a spin around New York's Statue of Liberty on what he claims is the world's only jetpack. Those stories and more after the break. Stay with us. El Nino may be behind the toxic crabs along the northern California coast. CNN revealed the rock crabs to be contaminated with high levels of demoic acid. Body. Fresh crab, the signature item at this eatery in the city's famed Fisherman's Wharf but this year is different. Can you recall a situation where you have not been able to get California crab? Not because of this reason. There's been strikes and there's been bad weather and there's been problems with fishing, but never because of uh, an algae. You know, this is something new to us. Algae has forced state wildlife officials to suspend the start of the Dungeness crab fishing season, always slated for the middle of November. The algae is producing the toxin demoic acid that gets caught in the food web, eventually making its way to the crabs. If the infected crabs are eaten by humans, they could pose serious health problems. Demoic acid can be fatal. And it targets a specific part of the brain that can cause brain damage, seizures, coma in, our, in marine mammals, but also in humans. It's all part of an algae bloom fueled by rising temperatures in the water known as El Nino. Blooms are common, but scientists say this is the largest and most persistent one they've seen in 15 years. It's already had a huge impact on sea lions. More than 200 sickened animals treated at the Marine Mammal Center outside of the city. Dr. Claire Simeone, a veterinarian here, estimates that 80% of them have died. The magnitude that we're seeing, the number of cases, and just the persistence um, throughout the whole year is unprecedented for us. Unprecedented as well for crab fishermen whose boats and traps are sitting idle. What's the economic impact to people like you? Well, uh, uh, last year, you know, November 15th, I'm making a living. This year, November 15th, I'm not making a living. So I guess I have 100% less income than I did last year. What do you make of this postponement? A disaster. Brett Smalley is headed back to his native Oregon. No crab means no paycheck. It's like gambling in a way, you know, you don't know what you're going to get if you get anything at all. You know, we lost this time, it looks like. Now, crab is to San Francisco what lobster is to Maine. It's part of the culture and heritage. Now, you can still get them at the famous Fisherman's Wharf, except these guys, they're from Washington. Scientists anticipate the toxin levels will decline. The question, though, is when. Crab samples are repeatedly being collected. But until the fishing begins, it will be a difficult time for all who depend on these California crustaceans. An Australian entrepreneur took a cruise around New York's Statue of Liberty on a jetpack. David Mayman has claimed his jetpack is the world's only jetpack. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? It's a man in a jetpack flying around the Statue of Liberty. It was awesome. It was a dream, dream come true, and I, w I was just having a blast. Though the actual blast off from a boat was fairly gentle. The founder of Jetpack Aviation, David Maiman, is the test pilot, and yes, he and his chief designer had to get all kinds of approvals to pull this off. 
And the FAA asked, what is it? What is it? A jet pet? What is that? The flight lasted about five minutes. The pilot uses hand controls and his body to steer, though Maimon took one hand off the controls for a second. I saluted uh, Lady Liberty, and on one of the passes, I stopped and turned around and, and, and gave her a salute. Maimon has been on jetpacks ever since he first saw James Bond take off in one in Thunderball. For 10 years, Maiman and designer Nelson Tyler have worked together. Tyler helped design the rocket belt that sent up a man for less than 30 seconds at the 1984 Olympics. For the Statue of Liberty flight, the designer told his pilot... Fly slow and careful and... Uh, not too high. Yeah, I didn't hear that message, I don't think. Next thing you know, he was 100 feet up doing 65 miles an hour. Maiman says he can imagine eventually selling a jetpack for the price of a super luxury car, somewhere in the ballpark of $100,000. There are other devices that transform men into flying machines. Some are big and bulky. Others, like these jet wings, require takeoff from a chopper and landing via parachute. But Maiman wants a jetpack like the one 007 wore. No well-dressed man should be without one. Yes, very practical. No well-dressed man should be without one, especially when taking liberties with a certain well-dressed lady. Don't go away. We have the week in world sports after this break. Stay with us. Good evening and welcome to World Sports. The people of Mount Hagen in Western Highlands have their own stories to tell about international football star David Beckham on his recent visit into the province. Fabian Hakelitz was in Mount Hagen where locals openly expressed their joy at hosting the football great. David Beckham's recent visit to Mount Hagen as United Nations ambassador caught locals by surprise. The FIFA soccer star has had a place in the hearts of soccer fans or even the general public in Papua New Guinea. Women of Kagamuga Interdenomination Modest Association in cooperation who work endlessly keeping the airport area clean got to meet the soccer star. Team leader Julie James actually shook hands with David and welcomed him. Proud lo welcome him lo province lo mebla. Time him come, me put him flower on neck long him, and me see him come, me to welcome. I'm again Papua New Guinea, and thank you very much. We feel like a big love, proud long see him come, most him because him stop long. The country blame him come straight long. The soccer legend played with kids, ate with people, and even. Mingled with them. I'm him kick go semna. I'm kick banana kick na. I'm go inside na. I'm not very wild at this level. Me plan just start him story that so na life me plan look in na. It was a privilege for Maria Pulavo. A privilege le pura le airport le me plan when me plan sa la clean him na so maintain him na. Me plan la look in sa la look la all people come long in na him so. I'm come him bring one plan and big plan was na. I'm encouragement for picking him long me plan was like him. Sports expressly so bad. Beckham's visit was described as a true definition of humbleness of an ambassador. Fabian Hakelitz, National MTV Sports. There is a stark difference between male and female soccer stars, but Spanish footballer Brenda Perez took part in a social experiment recently to prove that the sport is not only for men. A makeup team spent seven hours on the 21 year old professional player to turn her into male player Dani Perez. Perez challenged an amateur Spanish team in a match for a local TV show, saying she wanted to destroy some of the myths surrounding women's football.
¿Sabéis algo vosotros? Since his announcement to return to Rugby League, Sam Burgess has arrived in Sydney, Australia. Burgess will join his brothers Tom and George to play for South Sydney Rabbitohs after his release from English rugby club Bath. While returning to Sydney this morning, Burgess said he can't see himself leaving NRL after returning to the code from English rugby. His return to league is a permanent one. He told South Sydney fans he is ready to play good football. His experience in playing English rugby and in the recent Rugby World Cup has made him a better athlete. Burgess copped criticism following England's failed Rugby World Cup campaign. Although he did enjoy playing rugby, he knew that league offered him something different. Although he appreciated rugby and enjoyed the code, deep down league was for him. The 26-year-old believes he is better suited for league and is delighted to be back in Australia to play for the Rabbitohs. Many may say his venture to rugby was a failure, but he's proud of his achievements in the year and is thrilled to be back to play rugby league. Dion Kombang, National MTV Sports. In California, British American soldiers wounded in combat are trying to find something new on their road to recovery, but a surfing program is helping them get out of their confined rehab facilities and onto a surfboard. Bodies powering into the Pacific Ocean have stories to tell. They belong to American and British soldiers, some retired, some still active duty. All men and women injured while serving their country. We have our rash guards. It's got the Help for Heroes on there, Operation Surf. This is Operation Surf, a camp designed to aid these wounded heroes' mental rehabilitation by focusing on the physical. I've always wanted to try surfing. Jake Van Hovel joined the Army in 2005. He was injured in Afghanistan. My truck hit an IED, broke uh, my ankle, my heel, my back, my arm, and some other things. <laughs> Five years later, Jake elected to have his leg amputated below the knee, a choice he says greatly improved his life. I haven't ridden a wave all the way in yet, so that, that needs to happen. And allowed for this adventure. Cameron Crosby was on patrol in Korea when he was stabbed by a fellow soldier. He was paralyzed and had a collapsed lung. More than a year since his injury, he's better, but still has challenges. My right side can't, can still not feel temperature or pain, and my left side has mobility issues. You know, it's just a privilege to be out here. That's a beast. But not all of these soldiers' wounds are visible. Kosovo, Bosnia, Iraq, a couple of times, Afghanistan. Stacy Ashton was a medic in the British Army for nearly 14 years. Do you mind telling me why you were medically discharged? For PTSD. I um, suffered for about 10 years on and off and then kind of have uh, suffered from depression and anxiety. So what do you hope to gain from your week here at Operation Surf? Um, just some inner peace, I think. To stop being so sad. So. Ninety-nine percent of the time, they're standing up by the end of the day. Sure enough, it's not long before Stacy is up on her board. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I do think I'd be able to do it. Okay, let's go. For 42 years, Van Carraza has been catching waves. He began Operation Surf in 2009. It wasn't like this grand idea. It was just the opportunity of just being able to be a service to our our wounded servicemen and women in transition. Line yourself up, perfect, battle. So did you think you are going to be able to do that today? Yeah, that's, that's two in about the past 10 minutes. The closing ceremony is bittersweet. So I want to give this award to Stacy. A time to celebrate goals that were met and surpassed, friendships forged, and lessons learned in the water. Surfing is amazing. It's great re rehab. A lot of my anxiety has gone down and I feel, feel confident. 
to the world of rugby, and Nigel Owens is a household name from Wales to Australia. He refereed the recent final of the Rugby World Cup and is respected for his style on the field. He can lay down the law but also shows compassion. He is also gay. Owens talked to CNN about his journey towards self-acceptance. Normally, a referee or umpire is the least popular person on a sports field. But Nigel Owens is one of rugby's most lovable characters. Given a standing ovation at the World Rugby Awards, where he was named Referee of the Year a day after taking charge of the World Cup final. Listen to that. After refereeing his sport's most important match in front of 80,000 people and an estimated global TV audience of 120 million, Owens is at the pinnacle of his career. And he's been lauded by many who know his tale of triumph through adversity. In 2007, Owens was the first major professional rugby figure to come out as gay. A decade earlier, he was saved after trying to commit suicide. But few realize how serious the struggles over his sexuality became. I didn't want to be gay. I, I, went, I actually went to the doctor at one stage to see if I, if I could be chemically castrated in any way, if, I, if it would get rid of me being gay. You know, when my mum came, came to see me in hospital, when, when I tried to take my own life there, and my mum told me, uh, if, you, if you ever do anything like this again, and I was the only child, if you ever do anything like this again, then, then you take me and your dad with you because we don't want to live our lives without you. And I sat up in bed that night after she'd gone home and I, and I cried and I thought to myself, I, I need to grow up here and I need to accept who I am. And that's when I accepted who, and that was the biggest challenge in my life over with. Summoning the courage to come out was another challenge. But once he did, Nigel Owens never looked back until just before kickoff in rugby's World Cup final. So it was nice just to, just to stand there before the anthems on, on Saturday, standing between you know, the, the two best teams in the World Cup, uh, among some of the greatest players in the world, and just, and just reflect and, and think for a minute of, of everybody uh, who'd help you get there. And um, I always sort of my, lost my mum about six years ago, and um, always when the second anthem is being played, I always look up to the sky just for a couple of seconds. And I was looking up on Saturday for a couple of seconds, you, and you could just sort of picture a face looking down at you, know. And what did your dad think of your performance? Yeah, he was, he was very happy. I, I rang the club. Um, the first thing he said on the phone before he said anything else was, uh, how the hell did you miss that forward pass? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, Thanks, I Dad. <laughs> Although there are few openly gay athletes in many global sports, Owens believes his experience shows that rugby union has proved it's a safe environment for players and officials to come out. The biggest challenge that you ever come across in your life. The biggest challenge I came across in my life was, was accepting who I was. And that's one of the reasons, I think, why a lot of people are not out in sport yet. I mean, nobody can tell you what to do. You have to decide, first of all, yourself, if you can accept who you are. And then once you've accepted who you are, then, then rugby is, is there for sport for, for all. The diversity in, in, in rugby is, is there for, for everyone. And, and that's why I've said many times, it's not only the greatest team sport in the world on the field, in my view, but, but without a shadow of a doubt, the greatest team sport in the world off the field. Scottish-born BMX pro Chris Kyle teamed up with Red Bull for an optical illusion project called Kaleidoscope. Kyle, born in 1992, has been BMX riding since the age of 10 and showed off his tricks in Glasgow on Wednesday on a set constructed over a year and a half. The set includes various objects made of optical illusion elements to give the appearance of the inside of a kaleidoscope. Red Bull teamed up with Sony for the short film in another of its popular sports advertising campaigns. Yeah, they, like the whole crew, I couldn't have asked for a better crew. And uh, yeah, it was almost like everyone just clicked and we all fell into place. And then after it was like I made some great friends after that. And that's all the world sports we have for you this week. Stay tuned for the weather coming up next and also more jetpack fun. Welcome back to World News This Week. Now we take a look at the weather from across the globe.
And lastly tonight, Daredevil Jetman Eve Rossi and wingman Vince Reffitt made a stunning display soaring above Dubai's Palm Jumeirah Islands alongside an Emirates A380 airliner. The duo seemingly cruised alongside the plane at 4,000 feet using four engines in a 10-minute show, which is the limit of the jetpack's endurance. Jetman Rossi said it was a surreal experience flying alongside the biggest aircraft there is. The stunt show was meticulously choreographed over three months, considering the Airbus A380 could have immediately outstripped the duo as its top speed is three times that of the jetpacks. Emirates has an A380 double-decker aircraft fleet of 68 with plans to expand to 140 in the near future. Now for a quick recap of our top stories. Tension on Australia's Christmas Island after the death of Iranian asylum seeker Fazal Shegeni. E-commerce giant Alibaba takes in billions on its popular annual Singles Day and victims missing with around four confirmed deaths following a mining accident in Brazil. And that's all the world news we have for you this week. I'm Vanessa Knight. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night.